I would like to invite Shane uh, on stage to talk about, you know, give us direction in terms of omnipotent intelligence. Thank you. Me. That was yeah. good. You were all worried about it. Performance anxiety, right? Thank you. All right, let's see if this works. Because I am cursed with displays not working at the worst possible time. Everybody, send your good karma to this machine. All right. No looking. Woo! What the... All right, here we go. All right, you for the interview. So you guys can't see all the horrible notes I have. So uh, my name is Shane McDougall. Yeah, I kind of changed the title of the speech. I'm sorry about that. It, um, this keynote was kind of kicking my ass because I was thinking about it, you know, uh, talking about the future of OSINT. And it's like, you know, where we're at right now is really fluid. I mean, talking you know, long term about where we're going to be is kind of a fool's errand. That said, I still am a fool and try to do it at some points in the, in the presentation. But I want to talk about three different things that I think are really key to the field of open source intelligence and reconnaissance in general. So seeing is believing is, and uh, the future of recon and you won't believe what happens next all kind of tie together in a little bit. You'll see. So the standard disclosure right off the bat, this presentation and the ideas and the comments herein are those of mine and only mine, they don't represent my employers or my clients, even though they should, right? I mean, if the clients knew what was good for them, they would agree with me. But managers, right, they were born to disagree. So a little bit about me, uh, Shane McDougall. Uh, I've been a pen tester since 1989. Um, spent the first half of my career being a person that attacked systems. I've spent the second half of my career on the defense side. Um, these days, I work on the threat intelligence uh, part of, uh, of the corporate networks. I work for a major video gaming company. Uh, and most of my days are spent building and writing uh, tools to harvest uh, uh, open source intelligence data that can help my company uh, identify attackers and that sort of thing. Uh, as my gracious hosts mentioned, I do have two black badges from DEF CON by winning the social engineering capture the flag. Um, and I mean, I don't want to sound like a braggart, but it's important to say I'm also the only guy to ever get a 100% score in that contest. And I want to stress, you know, not to brag about that, but I completely attribute this, you know, the, my two successes to, I mean, not completely, but a huge chunk of it was because of the reconnaissance phase that I did, right? I mean, those extra points that put me over the top to give me the perfect score were things that I got from recon that nobody else was doing, and they were techniques that we'll talk about today. But Chris, right here, also, he won the SECTF last year. Chris, we're talking to you. Hey. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, importance of OSINT with social engineering attacks. Critical, would you say? Oh, absolutely. Right, push polling, right? If you can act and sound, critical. Uh, the, the type of attack you can successfully launch is would just boggle your mind. The stuff that we've been able to get people to tell over the phone, you're just like, I can't believe you're telling me this, right? But they do. So I do want to talk a little bit, though, about my history of predictions so that you know where I'm coming from. Um, 1988, I guess it was, I was... Uh, an undergrad at uh, engineering school, and you know, one of my professors said, hey, do you want to work with the graduate students? They're working on this cool thing called hypertext markup language. Well, eh, whatever, you know, get some extra credit. Went in, spent a day with these guys, and were like, it's links from text articles to other text articles. boop de doo right? <laughs> spent a day, I'm like, yeah, scintillating. I'm out of here, right, bounce. Because obviously I didn't, you know, back then we didn't have Netscape, there were no graphics, no, you know, no uh, videos, none of that stuff. It was like articles to articles to articles. So that's the visionary I am, right? I mean, I'm probably the guy that would have gone, Mr. Xerox, uh, I understand the 
concept, but I'm not sure there's a market for it. Right. So Peter Drucker had a great line. He said, uh, predicting the future is like driving down a country road at night with your headlights off and you're looking out the rear window, which is pretty close to accurate, I think. But we're going to take a drive anyway. So open source, as a, you know, uh, open source intelligence and recon as a, as a tool. What makes OSINT so compelling is that it's a completely passive process, right? We don't send a single packet to the target. We send our packets to people that have already hit that target, or the target has already hit, or people within that company have already hit, right? They have no idea we're targeting them. So if we want to know what technology a company is running, we don't run scans in their network. I mean, you can later if you want, or you can up front if you want. But instead, what I like to do is I go to LinkedIn, I look at every employee, all their future stuff. What have they hired? What technologies do they have on, right? Retired, current employees. Go to Indeed. Go to Monster, the job sites. Who are they hiring? What apps are they looking for? What technology? Just using open source intelligence, you can pretty much do a really good high-level technology stack analysis, again, without sending a single packet to the target. Right? And why does this keep going? So this is actually what OSINT used to look like. Anybody remember using this back in like 89? Yeah, right? Would I be far off by saying gigantic pain in the ass? <laughs> right? Finding the little nugget, you're like, I know that there were, they built this data center out and I want to find articles about it, but like you're scrolling and scrolling and scrolling. Yeah, it was a nightmare. But this is literally what open source intelligence and recon was for the longest time. Uh, and that's not to say there wasn't online data available. There certainly was. And ironically enough, back in the day, I know old timer, uh, government data was the most readily accessible. But that's because they'd actually had databases and data and big stuff. They actually, there was a time when government had their shit together, believe it or not. I know, hard to believe. Um, newspapers didn't have their stuff on, online. Though. That's only very recent, right? You see them on the scanning projects. That and that's because now we have Hadoop clusters and big, you know, they can distribute this work. And it's, it's a lot easier for them to do now than they could back then. LexisNexis, however, did exist back at the time. And that was kind of like the ultimate uh, uh, you know, source for OSINT or for you know, a personal recon. But where are we now? Well, obviously. You know, as my career has progressed, open source intelligence and successful recon has become a much bigger part of the attack and defense profiling for most engagements. And this is obviously due to the explosion of the internet and social media, right? We went from a little tiny drip, drip, drip of data that we could get to the biggest tsunami of data that the world has ever seen. I mean, if you look at the charts, the amount of data and the way it's going up, it's just exponential, right? And as OSINT professionals, if I mean, this is what the field you get into, or recon, or doing any sort of this stuff, it's one of the first things you're going to have to deal with is the data overload, right? It just, it's unbelievably hard. I mean, we're actually at a point now where we literally have internet connected toasters. Internet freaking connected toasters. That's more data that we have, right? But again, it's also a pivot point within, you know, target, so. So this was, I just put this up, it's not, even the cl it's not even close. This was like from four years ago. So take these numbers and times them by what? A hundred? <laughs> I don't know what the number is now, but just unbelievable, unbelievable amounts of data that are surging over the wire at any given time. And these are things that you are wanna, gonna wanna go through, right? It's like, I wanna look for anything that refers to this piece of data. And we start trawling through this and this pile you're never gonna get through this pile because it's growing all the time. So why do we use open source intelligence? Well, we said before, you know, it's usually free or at least relatively cheap. I mean, usually to obtain. The data has already been, has already been provided, so we don't have to mine it. Uh, well, I shouldn't say that. We have to get it, we probably have to mine it, but it's been pre-mined for the most part. The other nice thing is it's publicly available, which frees us, hopefully, from privacy law violations, which can be very costly. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. So Wall Street uses open source intelligence so that they can analyze companies. 
They can check the supply chains, look at threats to their income streams, and analyze risks, right? Law enforcement uses it to track people, shut down protests, discover crimes, that sort of thing. Uh, NGOs use it to protect their employees because a lot of them are in war zones. And strangely enough, social media in many cases is the most honest, up-to-date, real-time source of truth in war zones, right? So you'll see a lot of NGOs relying very heavily on mining social media. And then journalists and others use it to investigate targets, uncover stories, document war activity and crimes and that sort of thing. But in my humble opinion, the most important use of OSINT, well, actually, that's not true. This is the second most important thing. Right? This is, so we can pwn all the things, right? I mean, it really makes our life so much easier. Nobody else really has a, a need for OSINT like we do. Maybe spy agencies, but other than that, we really need it to do our job. Uh, but in my opinion, the most important thing that you use OSINT for is uh, online dating. Anyone here online dating? So I, you know, out of a 20-year marriage, I, you know, I started online dating for the first time three weeks ago. And um, I'm trying to think of the word to put for it. Freaking nightmare, maybe, would be the, right? Um, I can't stress the value enough of recon and OSINT in online dating. <laughs> yeah, you know? Um, <laughs> It's really good. If you really want to bounce someone who's you're like, you realize this relationship isn't working out, you can, oh, you know, quick Google search and hunting. Hey, are you Libby Morgenstern who lives on 7th and works at Whole Foods and you've got that dog, Peanut? And she's like, how do you know that? Discussion closed, unfriended. <laughs> Very good to know. <laughs> right? Um, do you think you've met Mrs. Wright or Mr. Wright? It's really good to be able to look at this and figure out if this person truly is Mr. or Mrs. Wright. You can find out a lot of stuff about people that they haven't let you know yet. So you just wait for that piece of information to come out. You know, oh, that teardrop wasn't from the Teardrop Festival. It was from your five-year stint at Full Sail. Right. <laughs> um, so as we advance, though, I mean, we can use, well, yeah. <laughs> we can use, uh, the way I, I see kind of OSINT evolving with dating apps, is we can actually use image and facial recognition. We'll be able to harvest basically a treasure trove of local information, right? You'll be able to swipe with your little swiper, grab the data, get their profile, get all the in personal information, and start putting that together into a, kind of like a, our own mini LexisNexis database. Um, it's really cool. We can de-anonymize people really easily and get their intimate, intimate details. Uh, and it's really not that hard. If we built a mini army of these automated swipers, scrape the data, we can pretty much enumerate the, entire, the company's entire database very quickly. I find OSINT is really helpful, too. Uh, it's a great defense tool in online dating, right? Because I don't know if you've noticed. I think I must be the only. I know you guys are lying. I can't be the only person that's online dating. <laughs> but I've learned the rules of online dating. And that's if every photo is from up here and the duck lips, right? They're hiding something. Usually 100 pounds. Uh, so it's a really good defense tool because you can actually find out someone's true stuff, right? So in my dating world, I just want to give you a couple of quick examples that have happened to me. Um, <clears throat> just with the first name on a dating app, you can get a ton of information, right? So one of the first people I started dating was a nurse, got a very unusual first name. So I put in first name and nurse and Googled, and it gave me four hits in the US. Four hits. That's pretty narrow, right? Now, she had a very run of the name. If her name was Susan Nurse, I'd probably have like, what, 50,000, 50 million hits, right? Um, so it was kind of interesting. I matched an image I had of her to an image I had a name, and all of a sudden, now I had last name, now I start digging, right? It all comes together real quick. So I was able to find property she owned, court action against her, family tree, you name it, the whole thing. Uh, the second thing happened earlier, uh, you know, uh, uh, or sorry, later that week, I met another woman, uh, had another very unique name. Uh, and from that, I was able to, I saw on the dating app that she was 0.6 miles from my place. So I took a little protractor on a map, 
know the neighborhood she's going to be in, put in her first name, the neighborhood, and within seconds I had her motorcycle makes and model, her address, her occupation, her hangouts, pretty much everything, right? Just because she had a unique first name. Although the really weird thing was, there were actually two people in my neighborhood with that unique first name. So I, at first I was all excited. Oh, she's a doctor, she's a doctor, I'm gonna be rich. She was like, no, she's not. You're gonna have to keep working, you lazy bum. So what makes OSINT and Recon so powerful for us as hackers? Well, as an attack tool, like I said before, it's as critical, if not more, more critical, than pretty much every other stage or every other phase of a pen test, right? The proper intelligence gathered can be used in a devastating social engineering attack. And I, I mean, I've lost track of the number of times in my life I've been able to come in and drop slang, internal um, you know, project names, uh, loca site locations, that sort of stuff, right? The old adage, if you look and act like you belong there, people are going to assume you belong. Um, using OSINT, uh, you can gather just insane things. Uh, one of the courses I taught a few years ago at Black Hat was uh, I had teams go out and they were assigned different companies. And one of my team, <laughs> I assigned them just as a lark, one of the largest defense contractors in the world. Uh, not going to say the name. <laughs> and uh, they were able to find everything from employee uh, names, addresses, social security numbers, salaries, black site uh, addresses, locations around the world, you name it. <clears throat> and they found that within an hour. This is one of our most critical pieces of infrastructure, and they were able to find this information within an hour on the internet. But like I said, right, this is the stuff you want to capture. The TPS cover sheet report, right? TPS report cover sheet. So, a physical layout, email addresses, phone numbers, network diagram, software, right? That's the sort of stuff we're looking for. So, with an open source intelligence, how many people here are really familiar with OSINT? I should have asked that right off the bat. Oh, okay, so there's a lot that aren't. So, there are actually many, many different types of open source intelligence. Open source intelligence, do you even know what that means? I guess I should have really framed what that is, right? Sorry. I didn't. Open source intelligence is basically intelligence that we get that's out there, that's publicly available, right? That's open source intelligence. Um, it can be on a website, it can be stuff that we grab from talking to people, whatever. But there are different ways, different types of methods or different types of sources of open source intelligence. There's human intelligence, cultural intelligence, geospatial intelligence, I think it's called, market intelligence, signal intelligence, technical intelligence, uh, image intelligence, and what's mass int? I can't even remember. Sounds good. I didn't even hear what you said. Sounds good. Uh, but there are tons of OSINT sources, and predicting the future of each and every one of these could be a conference into and of itself, right? Um, so what I'm going to talk about today is the one type of, of open source intelligence that I feel is woefully underused. And I say that because I know people that, that pen test every day. I've seen it. I've done it myself. And I know they don't do it. People don't do it, and they don't do it for a few reasons, and we'll show, we'll show why. But my favorite type of intelligence is called image intelligence. And that's where, try and guess it, we get intelligence from, you guys are super smart. Uh, I mean, the stuff that you can grab from, from image intelligence is just unbelievable. And it's stuff that you will often only find in images. Um, now, remember before I was talking about all the different things that we could look for in an attack, like email addresses, physical layouts of properties, and network diagrams, and all the stuff we'd really want as hackers to break into a company. Well, we can find those things. So, this guy, uh, if you've seen some of my talks, sometimes I talk about this guy because he's just one of my favorite targets. Uh, <laughs> You'll see why. Um, so I stumbled across this guy's Flickr account uh, a few years ago and decided he was really worth checking out for a variety of reasons, which you'll soon see. But just from him posting this business card, what do we grab from it? We get his cell phone, his work address, his work phone, his fax address, right? That's pretty good to know, and his employer, right? That's good stuff to know. So 
I started looking at his Flickr account too, and he posted this one. So I started to grab some other things I gleaned about his hobbies in his life. So what do we get from this Flickr upload? Carrier, correct? And he's got a sucky battery life, right? So there we go. So we know he's, he is an AT&T character, uh, and we know he's on an, on, an, on an Apple, on an iPhone, right? Which is important if we're going to launch an attack on it. So we have a cell phone number. Let's see if we if it meshed with at and So we went and we plugged it into one of these databases, and sure enough, he is on at and So we can, be, we can be pretty sure that if he gets a, a call from at and technical support or sales support, probably won't bat an eye, right? It's a legit call. We know his number. He's at and so this was another one that he posted on Flickr, and this, it started to get more and more interesting as I was going through his account. And he was talking about an event on Eventful that he had registered for. He goes, you know, fail. Eventful's a little too helpful with email addresses, with email address correction. He said, this isn't even my real email address, but earthling.net is the correct domain. So I'm like, oh, good to know. So he's got an earthling.net email account. And then he posted a follow-up, which is, you know, the event fail, fail, just keep getting worse. You know, this time with my real email address, Fail. I'm like, dude, you just told us your real email address. So there we go. And then he started posting things, you know, he posts a lot of other things, but he posts work pics of his work related hardware, including specific hardware like wireless adapters. That's probably something we'd want to know, right? Specific attacks. And then he had a bunch of photos of him doing asset scanning at some school. And in this one, we start to see some really helpful information. He's scanning at Bird Rock Elementary School, and I do a quick uh, check of Google, which shows me that's part of the San Diego Unified School District. I know from other posts he's made that he used to work there, so now I know he still is working there. So, right, another piece of information. Uh, he's using the Airy Jones Asset Scanning Program, and we can see the school's code is 0029A. Pretty useful information if you get a schmoozer like me on the phone, right, or in person. Um, this could be very useful. Also helpful, the IP address of the laser printer there on the back. I don't know if you see it, but they've got it sharpied on the upper right corner. 1040-17252. So people, please do not hack this school. No hacking the schools. Uh, here's another innocuous pic he took um, of him doing the asset survey. You notice, by the way, right before his face, what's that? The, yeah, map of the school. And in other following uh, pictures that he posts, we basically see the entire layout of the building, the facility. Uh, so this, at, at first glance, looks kind of useless. But when, what I did was I ran it through a high-res version, took a high-res version, exported it, put it in uh, Photoshop, ran a high-pass filter on it, and then I was able to start pulling out stuff, right? So how the bunch of laptops that they're scanning are Lenovo E10s. One of them has an asset tag ending in 78412. That's pretty useful. I mean, that's really specific information. If I can call up and say, I need you to pull out the Lenovo E10 that has asset tag 78412. Who the hell's on the other part of the phone? I don't know, but this guy must be part of our, our, our organization, right? But this one's my favorite. <laughs> So, you know, there's a basket with folders inside it, and the basket has computer passwords attached to it. This school literally keeps a basket of passwords. You may shoot me now. Well, is it though? I mean, I don't know. A basket of passwords sticking out, that's like a battle of badness. <laughs> Well, actually, uh, I mean, I don't want to go down too much the rabbit hole with this guy, but we knew for a fact that um, his dog's name was one of his uh, passwords, and we were able to find his dog's name from his Flickr account. Fair warning, though, um, the next ones are probably going to make your brain explode. I grabbed this off his Flickr er account, right? And this one, right? So off this one, we can glean that Data Center 2 has more capability and function than Data Center 1. And in case, you know, you weren't able to get the whole thing, <laughs> He's like, you know what, the first two weren't good enough. Let me make it so you can see the whole damn thing. So this is totally stuff you should be putting online, right? For future, no, that's not right. Oh, yes, he did. Right, so what do we have here? A DSL number. We have the, the gear name. We have, yeah, lots of stuff. And in fact, 
if we zoom in on the router. <laughs> yeah. It's, this is like a huge fail sandwich, right? I mean, with extra fail and less sandwich. Um, so basically, the wireless SSID, the network key, and the tech support <laughs> number. Could we do anything bad with that? You could be the shittiest social engineer on the planet <laughs> and still get control over the school, right? I mean, they, didn't, they don't make silver platters this big. Let me put it to you that way, right? But wait, it gets worse. So that's it with that guy. I mean, we could go, there, that guy is literally a talk unto itself. Google some of my talks, and you'll see me kind of roast him. But he's not alone in posting crazy shit. This is a uh, French secure data center. They literally post a video that is a video tour of their data center that shows where the cameras are, where the guards are, where the car key readers are, where <laughs> the exits are, the entire layout of the building. But the guards are all yellow. <laughs> That's because they're afraid, I think. I don't know. Yeah. Maybe it's a jaundice thing. Do you think that's something they should be putting up online? Probably not, right? How about this one? <laughs> the stupid, right? There is no patch for human stupidity, right? If you can't see in the back, push the number, new door lock, push the number two and number four at the same time, then push number three and press enter. Thank you very much. So why doesn't everybody do image intelligence? Well, great question. Thank you, Shane. Uh, because it's very time sensitive, right? Computers could not have extracted the information, or at least most of that information, that we did from those photos. Because a lot of it takes human intuition, right? Uh, at least not yet. And while we do have good character and image recognition programs, they aren't quite as good as we need yet. And we certainly don't have the AI for it yet. Like, look at that. I mean, it, that would be very hard for any sort of character recognition system to translate, right? And I know me. Like, I've, I whiteboard all the time, and I'll come back an hour later, and, like, I don't even know what that word is, and I wrote it, right? If I don't know what my handwriting is, how am I supposed to expect a machine to know what it is? So, you know, there are some issues. Um, there is a lot of research, though, that's going on in scene, detection, scene text detection and recognition. Uh, a lot of it's being done in China. I don't know why I keep saying ah. Sorry about that. It's just a stupid thing. Uh, don't do it. <laughs> uh, the Chinese are doing a ton of, of research into this stuff. Uh, one approach that they suggested that was initially kind of they, they were doing is they were doing a sliding scale per character. So they take each character and then match what, they, what the mathematical probability and the sentence structure should be to the character beside it. But that's really not a good way to do it. It's not efficient. You need a big list of every possible characters and for every word, a sequence. I mean, it's just unmanageable. So what they started doing now is they do what they call uh, component-based methods. And that's where they'll do stuff like color clustering, removal of backgrounds. So they start seeing if this is blank, just cut it down. So they start trimming stuff down to the smallest possible readable chunks that they use. And then they filter out non-text elements, basically according to a customized configuration that they build. And th there's a really good paper out there that you can see. It's by um, these guys from, I think it's Beijing University, by Zhu Yao and Bai. But you can see here, these are all being read very clearly, right? No problem there. But here, we see it actually misses stuff. And it's very hard for us to do image, uh, image and, and text retrieval because, especially in the real world, you'll see things like different colored backgrounds, you'll see different fonts and size, unknown fonts, different colors, shading. I mean, there's a ton of things that, that kind of boggle it up. The good news is researchers really think that big data and deep learning will help tremendously. And the consensus is, is within the next 10 years, we're probably going to have this problem solved. If you're interested in getting into text recognition, I would really recommend that you follow this. Uh, the account name is called Carlos Tao, which is probably the most weird Chinese name ever. Um, Peking University, awesome text, awesome scene text recognition is the GitHub repo. And I'll make these slides available so you can just grab these things. Then. 
So what is the future of image intelligence? Well, we're going to be able to unblur photos. That's definitely something that's coming down the pike. In fact, there are cameras now out there, right? You take the picture, ah, it's kind of screwed up, and you can roll it back. We're going to start seeing super high resolution. We're not going to have to be gleaning and putting in high pass filters and that sort of thing. You know, when you get to 4K images, you can really scroll up stuff from afar and see a lot of, a lot of patterns quickly. We're going to be able to detect and extract text. We're going to have facial recognition down. Location recognition is going to be a big thing, where basically you take a shot of something, and by, just by the background, they'll be able to start saying, at least if they can't locate where you are, we can start locating where you're not, which is just as valuable in many cases. Um, yeah, and advancements in cameras are already making image intelligence uh, easier. Uh, uh, we're already able to script some things where we can pull out things like uh, names from name tags. Right? That's, that's something we can do. So Amazon's already in on this. They have a product called Amazon Recognition. It's a deep learning based image recognition system. Uh, you can identify and detect objects, scenes, faces. You can recognize celebrities. It can identify inappropriate content, so i.e. nudes. They are literally deconstructing images into their base elements. So this is part of their marketing. They can do object, uh, object detection, object and scene detection. They can do face detection and facial analysis. Are you happy? Are you sad? Are your eyes open? Face comparison. Even do face search in a crowd. Right? All these Technology should give you a really good glance of where we're heading really quickly, what's coming down the road. And in fact, C-SPAN is already using this technology to automatically put names to speakers so that they've saved thousands and thousands of hours and a lot of money because now they don't have to do it by hand. So there is some good news uh, for recon and there's some bad news. We'll go over the first, the good news. The good news is people are creatures of habit, so they're always going to be using the same username over and over. We're going to be able to track them all over the internet, right? Stuff like that. We're going to be able to do things like have big data available to us. So let's say somebody posts some anonymous post, post about how it's raining like hell outside and we'll be able to pick up every weather station around the world, real time data and go, where is it raining right now? Start doing stuff like that. So I think the big future of uh, open source intelligence is going to be crowd-sourced open source intelligence. And we're already starting to see that happen. Um, we've had some, you know, it's not like social media is going to go anywhere. Because we, in any way that does OSINT, isn't, you know, we live on social media, right? It's what feeds us. But in order for it to survive, there has to be one of two business models. You either pay for it, or you let us mine, mine your data even deeper than we are now. And this is going to become a real issue because most social media companies are not making money. I mean, most Silicon Valley companies aren't making money, but put that aside, right? So most, sad, most users will sadly go with the advertising. They don't want, they'd rather sell all their privacy, all their data, instead of spending 10 bucks a month to protect that, which is kind of a sad state of affairs. So all of a sudden, if you're taking specific supplements, they can figure out what's going on, right? You're taking some sort of you know, supplement because you think you're pregnant. They, they can do that analytics, right? And hope, you know, or if you're trying to boost your testosterone, like I say, hopefully not at the same time, they can detect that. They can say, you know what? I think this person has Cushing's. They're already starting to do this sort of thing. We've already started to see some spin-offs of Reddit and Facebook that were community-driven. Some were more successful than others. Some are still going. Uh, none, obviously, nearly as successful as the original. We see very huge projects where they're crowdsourcing Wi-Fi maps. We're seeing crowdsourced phone books and contact lists. And these will continue to grow, most like, you know, either as a privacy-driven offshoot or as a pay-as-you-go privacy-type site. People that say, you know what, I don't want my data trafficked anymore. Here's an example of crowdsourced OSINT that's out. It's called Yushahidi. And frankly, I hadn't heard of these guys until earlier in the week when their executive director got fired for sexual harassment. Other, I mean, that showed up in my feed. It was, oh, okay, who are these guys? And you start digging into it. These guys are actually doing open source intelligence tracking in war zones. So they're tracking uh, human rights um, activities that you can report anonymously. Now, anyone see an opportunity here for an attacker, though? Right? You put up your own site where people can report stuff 
anonymously. We put a lot of trust into these vendors, but we don't know who these vendors are. Right? This is a real problem with open source intelligence. It's open, but who's putting what out there? Crowdsource geo, uh, geo terrain and satellite imaging. That's something that we're definitely starting to see. Um, we're already starting to see things like Tomnod, which is a crowdsourced uh, satellite um, crowdsourcing, uh, satellite uh, intelligence analysis, or analysis program. Uh, Bellingcat, which is terrestrial. Uh, I don't know if you guys have seen this, but this is journalists around the world doing some really amazing stuff with Bellingcat. And so, especially in the Ukrainian war, they've been able to really identify, hey, guess what? This piece of armament was in this location at this time. And they can even say it was in this meadow. Really cool stuff. I would seriously recommend everybody check out Bellingcat. And then there was something called Satellite uh, Sentinel, which was George Clooney. It was a very temporary thing. It was for the war in Darfur. But very soon, you might even be able to la launch your own satellites. Uh, Facebook.com slash spaceboffins. These guys are talking about mini uh, satellite swarms, nano satellites. So it's certainly not beyond the realm of possibility that crowdfunding a civilian satellite project. I mean, that's more than feasible, especially as lens technology comes down in price and uh, increases in uh, strength and power. You're very soon going to have civilian satellites. We'll be able to track what the government's doing. I don't think they'll like that. That's my guess. Crowdsource public camera database. That's something that I want to pitch at Chaos, and I still might. Um, I want to do my own thing where we basically take uh, Raspberry Pis and set up our own network where we capture license plates just like the police do, but make it totally open source so everybody can see where the politicians are going, where the police are going, where the people that want to tell us if we've got nothing to hide are going. Right. If I die, it was probably because of that, though. <laughs> The other question is, license plate, re you know, I, I don't know if you saw the thing on Facebook this week, you know, the new flying car, right? Are we actually going to have license plates on flying cars? So, I don't know, might not be worth the investment. Um, future of recon, though, bad news. Social media is going to definitely come under pressure to address hate speech, defamation, terror porn, and that sort of stuff. Or not terror, terror, comma, revenge porn. Maybe terror revenge porn, I don't know, Al-Qaeda does some crazy shit. Um, but they've already got uh, fines, so Germany just gave them a massive, well not massive, but five to $50 million euro fine is what they're proposing now if material is not taken down within 24 hours of a complaint. So guess what's gonna happen? Guess what the default action is gonna be when someone says, yeah, this offends me, or this is bad data. Do you think they're gonna wait 24 hours for some minimum, you know, $2 above minimum wage person to check it out? No, that data is gonna disappear like that, right? That's what the attack's gonna be, obviously. So it's gonna be really easy for us to, to suppress speech and data. So France has this thing called the CN, CN, CNIL, they have the Data Protection Authority. They're saying that Facebook does not have a legal basis under EU law to combine all the information it has on account holders to display targeted advertising, i.e. their frickin' business model, right? That's an existential threat to the company. It also finds that Facebook engages in unlawful tracking via data cookies of internet users. They continue to act in non-compliance. The maximum fine for next year will be 4% of global turnover or $20 million, whichever is greater. That sounds horrible until you realize they made $2.5 billion last quarter, right? So it's a drop in the bucket. It's a price of doing business. But not everybody's making money, right? Here's some other bad news for the future recon. I'm sorry, I'm gonna be like two minutes over our old problem with, re uh, with recon was we were designed to try and find needles in haystacks, right? Well, now we've got a bigger problem. Now we actually have to find which needles are actually legit needles. We have fake news. We have data poisoning, deliberate data poisoning. So now every time we find a piece of data, we actually need to validate that that piece of data is legitimate. Right? Twitter, I don't know if you saw this study, they showed that 9 to 15% of users are bots. They're fake, fake news, stuff that we can't trust. There's a site called Budometer.com, or the Budometer tool, you should check it out. And in data poisoning, we see this all the time, offensive and defensive uh, poisoning of data. So we could use that for really good and bad. Uh, we can jam up social media with fake accounts. Uh, content for keywords we know that oppressive governments are mining, we can just put that in every freaking tweet and over, you know, drown the analysts. 
as anti bot detection rises, so does the barrier to entry, right? So fake, account fake accounts are really easy to prevent. You need to tie it to an actual phone or credit card. But companies don't do this because it would impact their earnings. So the government is moving towards requiring this. And as that happens, we will start to see a lot of this go away. There's a thing out there called the uh, Crowdsourced Intelligence Agency. It's really neat. What these guys do is they actually, well, if you, you can put in a tweet and it will rank the probability and the highness of it being flagged by government filters as being offensive or needing real, uh, you know, law enforcement follow-up. So let's flip that OS, this OSN tool that was designed for good and flip it into bad. So let's find out that our target is traveling in a few months. So what do we do? We create an account for someone that exists. We have a bunch of sock puppets account, accounts follow that target. Or that someone that exists is him. We begin to interact with him. Now we set up a Twitter account uh, impersonating that person. We fill it with content from his social media. So we basically clone this guy on social media, take stuff from his Facebook account, whatever, post it. So now it's his account as well. It's his clone account that he doesn't know about. Over time, we start feeding the puppets, following our impersonation account as well. Care and feeding of these bots is important. They need to be legitimate accounts, not mindless. We tweet the occasional anti-government, but nothing too bad. Now we know the guy is about to hop on an airplane, and as he's at the terminal, we type in something like, today is the day I blow up an airliner. He's on the air, right? All those filters are going to find it. And the way we find out the tweet to use, right, we just, we just use that CS, the open source intelligence bot to tell us what the ideal um, tweet is to send out. Like I said, data poisoning is going to increase. We're going to see that. It's very important that you as a reconnaissance analyst always seek the validity of the source, always question who your source is and what their intent on releasing that information is. Um, some dark and vice data is going to lose its value, right? Right now, you can blackmail people uh, by geolocating them on Grindr, you know, or you know, gay ads. Um, nobody's going to care in a while, right? Sorry, guys, I'm coming, I'm coming, I'm coming. Um, a couple other things that I think are really cool that you should check out. Something called stylometry. It assesses sentence structure and writing style to identify users. So if someone's typing stuff, at, you know, um, and you don't know who they are, you can actually start to find commonalities between different posts on different sites. You're definitely going to see increases in both stylometry techniques and countermeasures. There is a countermeasure called Anonymouth. Um, there's also an R library that lets you write your own, rule your own stylometry lab uh, at Google. And like I said, I'm going to make these all available. And then there's a researcher, Kim Jouts, who also has a blog that you should check out. Um, the good news for us as pen testers, people are always going to continue to leak information. They're going to be looking for jobs, they're going to be government records, social media, GPS, sex and dating, right? People are going to do anything to get their groove on. It is inevitable that most, if not all, of the libraries that we've talked about before are going to be released to the public or we'll at least develop our own versions of them and they'll be open source. Just imagine the power that that's going to give the individual. But the really bad news is pretty much everyone's going to have access to this data. And the really bad news to all of us in this room is that as these technologies improve along with AI and as attack tools get more automated, well, perhaps, you know, edge case stuff is a bit more, requires a bit more digging, there's not going to be very much that AI can't do. We're not going to be employed to do the digging. We're going to have machines do it. Pen testing is not going to be a job. It's not going to be a career. I hate to say it. Who has the most power? The government. The government works for us. They make, there are some big decisions for us to make. Let's make the government make the right decision. We as hackers have competing interests. We should be the guardians of data. I know we're paid to attack that data, but we need to have an ethical and moral discussion. What side of this fence are we on? Are we aiding and abetting just for a paycheck? Is that who we really want to be? That's it. Um, you can always call me or email me, shane at tacticalintelligence.org. You can get me on Twitter. Tactical Intel is my tech account. Planet Shane is my comedy account. Um, thank you very much for coming. Thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, it was a big honor. Thank you so much. Sorry. Sorry for running over now. <laughs>